on this topic. Uh, in 2012, um, we started to inventory the status of measuring avoided emissions by companies. Uh, we did this together with WWF and Utrecht University. And uh, after this uh, research, we also helped companies in uh, calculating uh, annual avoided emissions and also in developing tools um, yeah, that can be used to communicate avoided emissions to customers. So yeah, part of uh, the uh, knowledge and experience that we have is also included in this webinar. OK, let's go to the first slide, the content. Um, First of all, I want to explain to you what are avoided emissions, uh, because it's a quite new concept. Uh, then I would like to explain why uh, companies would like to communicate about avoided emissions, uh, what are the benefits of doing that. Um, next, I will uh, explain how to calculate avoided emissions, uh, because there are some methodological challenges that, yeah, that need to be addressed. Uh, and then I will go to the guidelines for the for the chemical industry um, that I developed uh, or that I su I supported this development um, and I worked together with the World Business Council and the International Council of Chemical Associations and 20 uh, leading chemical companies were involved in this development and finally I will uh, yeah show you uh, which sectors have a high potential in avoiding emissions because some sectors have a yeah better are better positioned to do this than others. Um, so at the moment, already um, yeah, quite some uh, quite a lot of companies uh, are uh, trying to reduce their emissions by um, yeah looking at the activities within their own facilities, and by uh, yeah reducing emissions within the value chain. So the so-called upstream and downstream emissions. Um, but there's also another opportunity to reduce emissions, and also companies want to go further in reducing emissions by designing products that can avoid emissions in the value chain of other products of, or from other companies, and that is called uh, the green product portfolio or avoided emissions. So all these activities lead to a low-carbon economy. The top two activities um, yeah, can be are normally, uh, cal yeah, they are, how do you say, categorized as scope one, two, and three within the greenhouse gas protocol, uh, while the last activity um, is uh, what I would call avoided emissions in the rest of this webinar. Okay, then what are avoided emissions? Uh, here you see the simple life cycle of product A from company A. You have different life cycle stages, material acquisition, production, use, and end of life. And there, yeah, assume that there is a solution provider that provides a product X that is used within product A. And this product X has uh, yeah, such features that it can reduce the emissions of the use phase of product A. And yeah, that are then called um, the vo avoided emissions because they are the result of the use of product X in product A. And yeah, it leads to uh, reduced emissions. OK, this is a little bit abstract, so let's take an example. Um, as Fernanda already mentioned, uh, you can have fuel-efficient car tires. Um, a chemical company uh, can uh, produce an additive for a car tire that is re yeah, um, reducing the rolling resistance but is keeping the safe, same safety as uh, normally. And when this additive is used by a car tire manufacturer uh, in producing tires, then uh, e emissions will be saved within the use phase, and in this case it's driving a car. So you have less fuel use, less emissions, and also lower costs by using this additive in the car tire. Another example is um, a lightweighted aircraft. Um, a company that's producing specialty metals, um, yeah, will, these metals will be used by an uh, aircraft producer. And uh, by using this aircraft, um, there will be reduced emissions when yeah, going from A to B with the aircraft. So in that case, the airline is actually saving emissions. 
Um, another example is within the building sector. Um, uh, yeah, chemical industry uh, produces also ins insulation material, and that is then uh, used uh, in the construction of houses. And as a result of the insulation material, you have le you need less fuel for heating the home, and uh, you have again uh, reduced emissions. Another example is um, the windmill, uh, fuel-efficient ball bearings in a windmill. Uh, when you use fuel-efficient ball bearings, uh, you can uh, produce more energy um, than you uh, would with a conventional uh, ball bearing and a conventional windmill. So, yeah, you have more, you generate more energy. Uh, but when you assume that you want to produce the same energy, then you would need less uh, windmills. So in that case, you are um, avoiding material use, production, uh, energy during production, and also um, less materials are going to uh, waste. So avoided emissions most often take place in the use phase of another product, but it can also be uh, that emissions are reduced in other life cycle stages. I think now the uh, concept I hope at least that the concept is now clear. Um, then I want to point you at uh, different terminology. Um, because the concept is, is yeah, it's still quite new, there are different terms used for yeah, avoiding emissions or re emission reduction in other value chains. Um, the term avoided emissions was used um, by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Scope 3 uh, standard that is um, developed by uh, the World Resource Institute and the World Business Council. Um, climate positive products um, refer to the same concept, and uh, this term is used within the WWF Climate Savers program. Uh, the en enabling effect is also used within the report of JESSE. That's actually a report uh, set up by the ICT uh, sector. And then the term scope four um, it's also sometimes used, and it was introduced by Ecofis in 2012 within our research paper. So there are different terms. Um, I will use the term avoided emissions in this webinar because it was used by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, and it was also used within the guidelines of the, for the chemical sector. Okay, there are different uh, reasons uh, why companies communicate about avoided emissions. Um, first of all, uh, it's a good marketing uh, for your products. Um, because in addition to the common features of a product, like uh, the, the quality and the price, you have an additional feature, and that's the, yeah, the ability to reduce emissions in the life cycle of your clients and uh, not only emission savings, but also cost savings. So you can, have, when you are a producer of a certain product, you can uh, tell your client, when you use this product, you will also reduce the emissions within your company or within your value chain. Um, it's also, uh, communicating about avoided emissions is also a way to differentiate from competitors. Um, some companies set up a green product portfolio, and they also communicate about the uh, annually avoided emissions uh, that are realized by this portfolio. Um, it's, it is also a good way of raising awareness at value chain partners, stakeholders, and policymakers, um, especially for uh, companies and sectors that are positioned upstream the value chain, like the mining industry or the chemical industry. Um, they can um, communicate about the benefits of their products and the emission reduction potential of their products to downstream clients and also policymakers. So they do generate emissions uh, when producing the product, but later on uh, in the value chain, it will also lead to reduced emissions and also for society. So in that way, you can also communicate like what are the benefits of your products from your sector. And that was also uh, one of the reasons why the chemical industry wanted to have such guidelines. Um, I want to give you some examples about companies that communicate their uh, avoided emissions. Uh, the first one is SKF. It's um, a leading worldwide uh, 
company producing uh, ball bearings. Um, they are also climate safer within the WWF program, and they have um, yeah, created a product portfolio that's uh, focused on avoiding emissions, and uh, they call it Beyond Zero. And in, yeah, they also have a separate website on that, and in this way they differentiate from their competitors. Other example is a Dutch telecom company, KPN. Um, they developed an easy to communicate and interactive web-based tool for their clients. Uh, the clients can um, yeah, start playing with this tool and they can find out like how many emissions they will reduce when using products from KPN. Uh, for example, video conferencing uh, will reduce commuting from your employees or um, yeah, yeah, like a more efficient servers will also reduce emissions uh, from computer use. So in that way, uh, it's a good way of communicating to clients like what can our products do for you as a company. Then the last example is Goodyear. It's a car tire manufacturer and they um, have also a simple calculation tool on the internet to uh, give advice to um, clients how they can reduce costs and uh, emissions. I think that now you know what is, you understand what is uh, the concept of avoided emissions and also what is the benefit of communicating about these um, avoided emissions. Um, but now it's the question like how can you calculate avoided emissions? Um, the calculation is based on life cycle assessment and it's actually uh, the avoided emissions are the difference between uh, the, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from two alternative solutions that, it, that achieve the same user benefit. Um, there are also some methodological challenges in this because um, you have to define the baseline to hey, you are comparing your product to a certain alternative available in the market, but how to choose this baseline? Because hey, you can choose a product that's not performing so well, and then um, you can have really high potential for avoiding emissions. But that is not, per definition, um, yeah, a product that's that's sold the most, or uh, so you can. Uh, choose the reference a little bit in this, yeah, that will show off your product the best. And um, yeah, that is of course what you want to avoid because you want to have credible results. There are also some other methodological issues that are listed on the slides. Um, for example, uncertainty future developments within energy efficiency or um, renewable energy. Um, there's also an issue of how to distribute the benefits of avoided emissions among the value chain partners because it's often the result of a complete value chain. Um, I will go into these methodological uh, challenges when I go to the more explanation about the guidelines for the chemical industry because they address these issues and they have uh, provided guidelines on how to deal with that. So there are already companies that, uh, that sell enough of products that enable emission reductions and they also communicate about it openly. Um, yeah, despite these opportunities, companies face also challenges when introducing these innovative products because they um, want to have credible uh, results or credible avoided emissions that they uh, want to communicate. There are already existing uh, LCA standards, like the ISO 14040 and 44, and um, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, but these uh, standards, um, they exist, but um, from the market search, it appears that not all companies implement or calculate avoided emissions in the same way. Um, so it was necessary to... Um, yeah, to have an extra explanation for certain mythological issues to ensure that all companies will uh, apply uh, or calculate avoided emissions in the same way. So you will have comparable results and also credible results. 
Um, so companies, they recognized this and they uh, started to develop sector guidelines. Uh, the ICT sector developed guidelines um, within uh, JESSE, that's the Global E-Sustainability Initiative. And it represents, uh, represents 30 leading ICT companies. Uh, so they developed a report uh, that is um, dealing with certain issues, certain mythological issues. And then the chemical uh, sector uh, developed uh, guidelines under the umbrella of the World Business Council and the international uh, the, the ICCA. So I will uh, go into more detail uh, for this uh, chemical sector guidance. Um, first of all, uh, the guidelines uh, were developed by 20 leading chemical companies, uh, and ECOFIS supported this development. Um, it's developed between July 2012 and uh, June 2013. It was published uh, last year in October. You can um, find the report at the links that uh, are shown on the slides. And the uh, aim of the guidelines were to see, were to improve comparability and credibility in measuring and communicating avoided emissions. So how did um, these guidelines deal with the mythological challenges? And which challenges did they address? Here you see a list of five uh, challenges that are included in the guidelines. Uh, first, the selection of the baseline, which is a very important one. Second, it's the uncertainty in future developments. Um, third, uh, the attribution of avoid emissions uh, to value chain partners. They also included a simplified calculation methodology. Um, yeah, in the case of data gaps, uh, you can use this methodology. And then the inclusion of multiple environmental impacts. In the next slides, I will uh, go through these mythological challenges. I will first explain what the issue is, and uh, then I will show how the guidelines uh, were set up to, to tackle these uh, issues. So first, the selection of the baseline. Uh, here you see the, um, yeah, the, the life cycle uh, of product A and the life cycle of the solution provider. Um, so when, when you want to calculate avoided emissions, it's important to compare the product A or company A to a certain baseline. Um, and this baseline can be different. Yeah, can be, there are the, a few options. The first one is um, to compare your product to an old product. And that is actually when you want to do performance tracking within your own company. Um, the second option is to uh, compare your product to a product with the same function in the market with a high sales volume. And the third alternative is to compare your product to an industry average. So there are different possibilities in choosing this baseline. And uh, yeah, that, that will all result in different uh, values for the avoided emissions. So the uh, chemical sector guidelines, they have created um, yeah, uh, recommendations or requirements on how to do this. And uh, as the chemical industry is positioned upstream, down, upstream the value chain, um, it's important to first uh, decide at what level in the value chain the study focuses on. Because you can compare your chemical product to another chemical product or an alternative product. Um, but you could also focus more downstream the value chain and, and see, have a look at the end use level. So when you look at the chemical product level, in fact what you do, you measure the reduction in emissions of a product relative to an alternative product or an alternative chemical product or the industry average. And in fact, this option can, yeah, is similar to a comparative assertion according to ISO 14044. Um, when you do the study at an end use level, you assess the contribution of a chemical product to emissions avoided by the use of a certain low carbon technology. 
and this low carbon technology is then compared to um, the implemented mix of technologies. And this study at the end use level is more related to what I uh, explained in the previous slides on what are avoided emissions. Okay, to give an example of how this works, um, here at this slide you, we ha I have the example of the value chain of wind electricity generation and some uh, alternatives uh, that satisfy the same user benefits. At the bottom of this uh, graphic, you see the chemical product level, and at that level, um, a company can compare its chemical product X that's used in a certain resin, and it can compare it to uh, chemical product Y for the same resin. Um, but when you want to do a study more downstream the value chain, um, it can be the case that you compare uh, blades for wind turbine with an alternative set of blades for wind turbine. Or you could even uh, compare the emissions from uh, wind electricity generation with the emissions from the grid mix. So that are quite different studies. And therefore, there are two types of baselines identified. When you do the uh, comparison uh, at the product level, um, the product for comparison is an alternative established product in the market with a high uh, market share. And is an indication um, this will spoot at more than 20%. But the most important uh, rule is that, it ha that your product has to be compared to um, an established product in the market. Um, at the end use level, um, the uh, product for comparison is the weighted average based on the shares of all currently implemented technologies. So in the case of the wind electricity generation, it has to be compared to the average grid mix of Europe, for example. Um, then here, uh, at this uh, slide, there's a lot of text. Uh, it actually lists literally uh, what was put within, within the guideline. So I copy-pasted this. So when you want to select a baseline, you have to make sure that the solutions to be compared shall be uh, at the same level in the value chain. They have to deliver the same function to the user. Um, they have to be used in the same application. And they have to be distributed and used on the same market. And um, then there are some specific uh, requirements for the chemical product level and end use level that I just explained to you. Um, so yeah, these are the requirements that you have to follow when you want to yeah, calculate the avoided emissions of your chemical product. Um, then the other issue, um, the uncertainty in future developments. Um, when you see these two value chains here, um, the company or the product A is compared to the baseline. And for the upstream uh, emissions, so that's, that's actually here, um, you can see that um, yeah, these are often taking place in the past or in the present. So you know um, what, what are the data, you can collect it, and you can calculate what are the emissions now. But when you go to the use phase, and these emissions actually take place in the future. It can be within one year or two years or five years, but it can also uh, take some time before emissions take place. Or, and yeah, so for example, uh, with a building um, that can be used for 50 years, for example, and then uh, when you have uh, used insulation material that will stay in effect for 50 years, but maybe the uh, situation can change. Uh, for example, uh, there will be different heating systems or, um, yeah, there can be all kinds of changes. And with a windmill that can, uh, yeah, can uh, have a lifetime of 20 years or longer. 
And when you then compare the wind electricity to the um, grid mix, the grid mix changes within 20 years from now. So the avoided emissions can also change due to that. Uh, and it's likely that um, within 20 years we have probably a higher percentage of renewables in the grid mix and that will also have an effect on the avoided emissions that will be lower than uh, they are uh, at the moment. So these future uncertainties uh, on energy efficiency, energy mix and end-of-life treatment um, and also user behavior, they can all affect the estimated avoided emissions. And that should be um, addressed uh, when you have a product that has a long lifetime. And therefore, uh, the uh, chemical sector guidelines, they included um, uh, guidelines on this. So um, first, a company that wants to calculate avoided emissions with a long lifetime, they have to um, calculate the baseline uh, and then assume that there are no future changes. So you have to use the latest actual data. And in addition to that, the company should all the reporting company should also make clear, um, yeah, uh, how this uh, these avoided emissions can be influenced by future changes. And they should do that when they have a product with a long life cycle or a, lo or a long use phase, and that can be more than 10 years or longer. 10 years is just an indication. So when they have a product with a long lifetime, they have to do a qualitative uh, scenario analysis. And in that analysis, they have to explain for each uh, parameter how it might change uh, in the future and how it will influence the avoided emissions. So in that way, um, people can also understand like, um, okay, these are the avoided emissions now, but how will that, uh, um, how will that develop in the future? And instead of performing a qualitative analysis, um, the reporting company may also calculate an alternative scenario using a discount factor, like what's done in finance. So then you um, yeah, value the avoided emissions in the far future uh, less than in the, yeah, in the present. Um, and the third issue that was addressed in the guidelines is the attribution of avoided emissions to value chain partners. So it's actually like, uh, how do you allocate the avoided emissions to partners within the value chain? Uh, most often, um, avoided emissions are realized by all partners within the value chain. And they all have a different contribution to the avoided emissions. So when we take the example of the car tire, you can see that the chemical company, they have a contribution to the avoided emissions, but the, car, the tire manufacturer also has to use this chemical product to make tires, and the car manufacturer should buy these uh, tires for uh, car manufacturing. Um, so, yeah, uh, each company within the value chain m may want to communicate avoided emissions, and... Uh, it's actually a double counting or multiple counting, uh, but it does also not reflect the contribution of the product to the actual uh, avoided emissions. So how to deal with that? Um, so in the guidelines, the reporting company must clarify its role in realizing the avoided emissions in the value chain. So they will report the complete or the total avoided emissions um, but they also have to indicate what the role of their product was in realizing these reduced emissions. Um, this table shows different levels. Uh, fundamental is like the highest contribution to avoiding emissions. And in that case, the chemical product is the key component that enables the greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, and when you go to the bottom of the table, the uh, contribution becomes less and less. And uh, at the bottom, you see too small to communicate. So in that case, when the chemical product has really a small contribution, then actually um, 
yeah, you have to show it, and maybe it's also not a good idea to communicate about this. So when, yeah, when they use this, uh, it's it's also becoming clear like what their products actually contributing to the, uh, to the real life of what it emissions. They also tried, or they made an attempt to show how you could allocate uh, avoided emissions to value chain partners. It was a recommendation uh, to companies to try this out. And it's not an actual requirement, and therefore I've not included it in the webinar, but you can find it in the report. Then, um, Oh yeah, this is a summary of uh, what the guidelines also mention about this attribution of avoided emissions. So the reporting company shall report the total emissions avoided along the complete value chain, and they shall also report the significance of, their, of the contribution of their product to uh, the, the avoided emissions. And in addition, the reporting company shall also describe the role of the product and so that the reader understands like what um, what is the product actually contributing and how. Then uh, there is the simplified calculation. Um, you want to calculate for the emissions downstream the value chain. And in some cases, it's hard to collect data from uh, other sectors or competitors uh, on, for example, the uh, house or automobile. And, um, and in addition to that, these um, two life cycles also often have identical life cycle stages. Um, I will show that on the next slide. So in this graph, uh, you can see, for example, that there is an identical uh, life cycle stage. Um, that's the dark blue uh, bar. Um, so it has the same greenhouse gas emissions. But you can all have calculate everything. Uh, but when you know when the emissions are the same, I mean, uh, you know that you have the, the same car, for example, but one has other tires than the other, um, and that's the only difference, then you know, OK, this car has the same emissions, um, but the car tires make the difference. So that is a way to... Um, yeah, to deal with data gaps or to make the calculation more simplified. But the guidelines um, of the chemical sector, they have as a first requirement, uh, whenever possible, the full life cycle should be considered when calculating avoided emissions. And um, yeah, that's also needed to comply with ISO 14044, the standard for LCA. Um, but when when it's not possible uh, due, to, due to data gaps, and you know that the identical life cycle stages have the same emissions, then you can use the simplified approach and omit the identical parts in the uh, life cycles. The last issue is inclusion of multiple environmental impacts. Uh, most of the guidelines that are available right now, now focus on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but there are other environmental impacts that can be important as well. Uh, so trade-offs can take place. That's also shown by the two arrows uh, at the bottom. Um, so it can be the case that you, with your product, avoid greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time that uh, other environmental impacts are increased. For example, resource use like water depletion or toxicity or land use. And when that is the case, yeah, then you have to be critical on your own product. Um, so, yeah, how to deal with this trade-off? So ideally, the avoided emissions uh, takes all life cycle impact categories or all, yeah, from LCA or all impacts into account to make sure that when greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, that other impacts are not increased. The guidelines um, tell that um, you first have to do a full LCA study, um, but when that's not possible, then you can do an analysis that's focused on greenhouse gas emissions. The reporting company shall check if trade-offs are uh, existing. 
um, with other environmental impacts by doing a screening LCA, so that's more simplified LCA, making use of uh, many uh, generic data. And if trade-offs are identified, the reporting company shall report on these environmental impact categories and uh, should even consider to not communicate for the emissions. Okay, so that were the methodological challenges and how the guidelines address these. Um, it is the aim of the chemical sector that all um, chemical companies uh, around the world use these guidelines to make avoided emissions values from the chemical sector credible and comparable. Um, it's good to stress that, it is, that these guidelines are a first attempt uh, to um, standardize or to give guidelines on avoided emissions accounting. Um, and what they would like to, to, yeah, to, uh, to achieve is that also other sectors try to use these guidelines and to see if it works for them and to give feedback. So partners in the value chain, for example, they are encouraged to also use these guidelines and to see if it works for them or not, and to report it back to uh, the chemical industry. Then, um, yeah, finally, I would like to show uh, for which sectors um, avoided emissions can be an important topic. Um, this is the result from the research that Ecovis did in 2012. Um, at the top, it's chemical industry and chemical products. It will not surprise you. Um, but also um, ICT sector, um, uh, like uh, telecommunication, uh, is a sector with high potential. Uh, but also construction, rubber and plastics, and um, yeah, also the electrical equipment. So, yeah, if you are active in one of these sectors, uh, the topic of avoided, of avoided emissions can be, uh, yeah, can be relevant for you. And you could also uh, start calculating avoided emissions and communicate about it. Okay, then as a conclusion, um, I would like to uh, yeah, give a summary of the strengths and the weaknesses of avoided emissions. Uh, the strength is that it focuses on solutions instead of reducing problems. And it can be an incentive for companies to start thinking of innovative, low-carbon solutions. I think that is really a strength of this concept. A weakness could be that without proper standardization, there's a risk of greenwashing. Um, and therefore, international standards, uh, yeah, they would increase credibility of avoided emissions values. And last year, End of 2013, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, they uh, sent out a survey to find out if companies uh, need, if they have a need for a standardization of avoided emissions, and it appeared that this is the case. And um, yes, so Greenhouse Gas Protocol, the World Resource Institute, is now also considering to prepare international guidelines for avoided emissions accounting. Then I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions with regard to avoided emissions accounting or communicating, uh, feel free to uh, contact me. And my contact details are on this slide.